once again in our continuing series on picking the liberal brain. As you may have seen on some of our other shows, uh, we have Mark Bland with us, who is a local St. Louis radio personality. Uh, trans Entertainer. That's debatable on how entertaining he is, but nevertheless, he is a liberal or perhaps a moderate, depending on uh, how you want to define the term. Fair and he's someone that we brought on to our show because you've heard me say it in the past that it's not enough to just say, okay, I disagree with the liberals or I disagree with the moderates. I want to know why they're thinking as they do. I want to pick their brain a little bit. I want to understand where it is they're coming from. So Mark Bland has been gracious enough to come in here and uh, subject himself to this psychological experiment. Quite painful. Quite painful. Now, Mark, if you are, are unfamiliar with him, is a local radio personality, and you can find him every Wednesday night on the iWatchRadio.com network, and that's at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central for the Q with Mark Bland. And then also, if you can't make it to that time or you want to hear some of his uh, previous archive shows, you can go to his personal website, theqnow.com, for all of his previous efforts. Yes. All right. Mr. Bland, as you know what we've been doing on these shows, we've been talking about some very general issues. You've been spinning a lot of things over the last few months uh, or weeks, however this is looking to people, and uh, I've been trying to set you straight on every single show. Unfortunately, you don't play along. Doesn't play well with others, fail. I do not play well with others, I've always admitted that. But what we're doing is asking about some very general topics that liberals and conservatives, moderates and conservatives, always seem to disagree on. Undertaker Man. will win. What? Is that it? Undertaker? What are you talking about? Undertaker will win. Yeah, these are topics that people just generally disagree about and things like that. I think The Undertaker is going to be true. Oh, it's it, it, this shows you that he and I both came from the wrestling world, I, but oh, I have sorry. not... I thought he was have, talking about that. I actually have not watched any of the WWE shows in the last year. I didn't even know he was wrestling. So, that, <laughs> so I, yeah, I feel probably what he always does. I don't know. Nevertheless, the question of the issue I wanted to talk about today was the idea of war, the concept of war. Sure. Good God, what is it good for? Okay. This is a topic that typically liberals and even moderates disagree with conservatives an awful lot. In fact, there's even some disagreement within the Republican Party right now on this topic when you look at Ron Paul and his people. So, well, war is not a good thing. Nobody is, likes to kill each other. I mean, it's not necessarily one of those pleasant things. I mean, I don't think Travis would like to walk outside of his house and get shot. I don't no, think well, that's no. necessarily something he, he thinks about. And uh, what might surprise, maybe not you, but it would surprise some other people out there, is that conservatives really don't like the idea of war either. But yet it is the type of topic that tends to... Uh, tends Unless to business is involved, yeah, we'll then yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Let me set you up here. I'm a professional entertainer. You keep professional saying entertainer. the word professional. So here's what we're doing. The idea of war. We, we want to talk about that a little bit, and I have a couple of questions for you. First of all, do you believe that it is possible for human beings to live in long-term peace with each other? I do not believe that that's possible. I do not believe Okay. I don't believe that's possible because, in general, we're talking about the entire Earth. Eventually, somebody's going to piss in somebody's apple cart mm -hmm. two months into the peace process, and uh, it's going to start another war. And while I don't have a lot of Plus, religion is touchy, so... And, and while I don't have a lot of familiarity with urinating in apple carts, right. uh, I understand that happens in South St. Louis during Mardi Gras a lot of times, Yes, I, I don't know a lot about it personally. I largely agree with exactly what you said. About you have to, because it's based off of logic. It's not based off of anything other than logic, which is where most liberals come from. Or, as we often say, even a blind squirrel can find an acorn in a mud hole sometimes. I but guess, nevertheless, the fact I, that I, just... I agree with what you said, that human beings cannot live peaceably in the long term. World history has taught us that, if nothing else. Uh, so we, we Brothers uh, and sisters have taught each other that. Yeah, it's, exactly. So, so we, we know that through the human condition and what we understand of human psychology, that long term peace really is a, I don't want to say it's a bad goal, but it's really, really not a realistic It's not a myth. It's just Pretty very vicious. difficult to attain. And I would say impossible to attain. So I wouldn't say impossible. Nothing's impossible. I mean, anything's possible. But this is about as close to impossible as you can get. I mean, yeah, it's pretty close yes. to okay. impossible. It's pretty close. Okay, so understanding that long-term peace is almost impossible, as we All say. Right. And understanding that there will always be potential enemies that any society would have, of including ours. Of course. What do you believe is a bigger deterrent to our potential enemies? The potential of overwhelming force and destruction, or the potential of appeasement and negotiation? Um, I guess it's, that really depends on who you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody comes from a different cut in this world. And 
some cuts are you know smooth people that don't mind sitting down and hashing things out some people like you know Somalian warlords and things like that they you know all they understand is guns to their head everybody's everybody's cut like different jib you know cut from a different I'm not sure what a jib is but but, uh, but I see what you're saying jib jab jib jab uh, uh, but, but by, what you're saying essentially is that there are different cultures and different people out there who understand that different will things. respond to different things now I think that for most people, they would rather try to talk it out at least once before they cut to the gun. Mm -hmm. But some people just don't care. And it doesn't matter how many times you talk it out, they're just going to cut to the gun every time. Okay, so basically, to use an example, let's say that America had some kind of dispute with Canada. Okay. Over, I don't know, maple syrup. Okay, sure. Okay? I would say uh, that, that Canadians are generally the type of people we can talk through a little bit, at least at first. Oh, of course. And so maybe some sort of negotiation with them would be fruitful, right? Yeah, very, very much okay. so. Okay. But there might be other groups of people. You out also got to realize, too, before we go any further, you also got to realize that when we are talking about this, this situation with war, in most cases, the thing you see on TV is just the bad people, okay? It's not like, you know, all of South Africa or all of the Congo or all of Iraq and Iran is just negative people running around wanting to kill each other, okay? It's usually just a certain section of the people that happens to get on TV a lot because people like to see chaos and because they're entertained by chaos in general. And so, therefore, you base your decisions based off the chaos you see on TV. Well, they're always got their turbans on and they're waving their guns and they're screaming Allah Akbar and all this stuff and screaming about how they hate white people and they want to kill the white devil and kill the Americans. Okay, yes, but that's only 200 people here. There's an entire nation of millions that don't, they, they're not a part of the 200 is my point. You, so, so speaking of the people who are wearing the turbans and yelling Allah sure, Akbar sure, sure, and sure. all of that as you I was using that because everybody is into this terrorist mode. And with good reason considering, you know, we were attacked. Uh, At least 10 years ago. Yeah. And uh, the Eleven years still exists today. Uh, so the, the, the it point, existed the before point, that. The point of all of this is that those people who are of that mind, whether it's 200 or 2 million or 2 billion or whatever right. the number is, you would likely agree, I would assume, mm -hmm. that... Stop saying that because if you assume that it just makes you, it makes an ass of you and me. Wow, the oldest joke in the book and you oldest managed to bust it on my show. That's a professional entertainer. Okay, Ooh. so you would, would you agree? Would you agree? Uh, that this uh, towel-headed Allah Akbar stuff okay, yes. would be a little or perhaps even a lot less open to negotiation and reasoning than, say, the Canadians who you might have a dispute with over maple syrup. I would say those 200 are. I don't think that that necessarily is the government of those specific countries, and when we're talking in generalities of war, it's not just our 200 people we sent over there versus those 200 nut, nut jobs that are on TV. It's usually our entire country represented by people like Hillary Clinton, who's Secretary of State, going over to discuss things with their person who's the equivalent of her in their government. Do you see my point? So that guy who she's going to talk to, he doesn't run around with a turban on his head screaming all Akbar and you know, pulling triggers. That's not how he works. Okay. And that's not how the majority of the people she talks to will work. And that's not the majority of people in those governments work. They do sometimes fall into that regime, like you you do have your Mo Market office. Mm -hmm. You do have your Kim Jong Il's, the guys that are a little, you know, out there and they have a lot of Saddam Hussein's, a lot of whack jobs around them that are willing to pull those triggers. You do have that, but for the majority of situations, we sat down with Saddam Hussein. We sat down with Muammar Gaddafi. We sat down with what's his name over in Iran. Uh, Ahmadinejad. Uh, 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 Ahmadinejad. Okay. We we sat down with these people and we do talk to them. They're not always just pulling the turban out and pulling the guns. Like so, it's possible that they are normal people, and we're basing a lot of our opinion off of the two to three hundred people that happen to be a part of the, you know, the Taliban or the this or the that. You know that we see on TV doing crazy shit. We can't really always just assume that it's everybody. Okay, so basically you're saying that we should go in in almost every situation and try negotiation and talking face. -to -face. I would try it first. Okay. I mean, if it eventually devolves into a situation yeah. where we got to pull guns, then hell yeah. Okay. And I think that's totally reasonable. I think that's totally reasonable. When we get to the point with certain places, okay. certain types of people certain who, situations. to whom negotiation has not been fruitful, we have talked and it's to apparent that it's not going to Saddam be. Hussein four times, okay. and all four times he has just been completely obliterated, yeah. to the, and now we want to do it a fifth time, and he's like, screw you guys. When we get to that point, yes, 
and the safety and security of our own nation is on the line, because okay. not only our, our brave men and women who are fighting, but even our, our okay. uh, individuals are, our, uh -huh. uh, you and I. Red Dawn. Red Dawn. Red Dawn. Like, yeah, okay. Now, Civilians. They're like, are we being, line. now, you're, go ahead, ask your question, okay. I gotta have another question. When, when that, when it comes to that point, uh -huh. is it more important for our nation to adhere to some sort of arbitrary expectation of, I'm using the air quotes here, rules or fairness when dealing with these issues, even if doing so compromises our own safety? Okay, are we talking about being attacked on our own, or are we talking about taking, because we live on an island, pretty much, called North America that is completely surrounded by water on both sides. Most of our enemies that we need to get to, aside from potentially Mexico, that's looking a little weird down there. Oh, it's looking way weird. It's looking a little weird down there. And, uh, it's been looking weird for years. They got quite a few people over on this side of that border. So that's a little, yeah. but at the same point, my question is, is are we being attacked on our, or are we talking about taking it to them? What I'm talking about is when the potential exists uh -huh. significantly, all right. For harm to be done either to American soldiers uh -huh. or, in this case, American private citizens in our own country, for example, or even American private citizens abroad. When their safety is on the line, should we really worry about things like, say, the Geneva Conventions or, quote, international law, particularly if our enemies, I think when, particularly if our enemies are not adhering to those same things? When the crap hits the fan and it's wartime, I think that pretty much all bets are off. You know, the one thing that I agree that George Bush said, and I'm talking about Junior, the, the weird one with the big ears who talked about Wasn't well, weird, but go ahead. Yeah, he was a nut job. The one thing I did agree with him was he made a comment one day to a press person at, uh, from the press corps that comes in. To yeah. The, he had a, a general conversation. Well, every week he does, the president always does things and where he answers questions. Yeah, as a press conference. conference. Well, there was one time when one of the people asked a simple question and he basically came back. He didn't snap on him, but he kind of came back and he goes, let me tell you something. There are thousands of things, and I'm paraphrasing by the way, thousands of things that happen every single day to ensure the freedoms that you take for granted. True. Right? He says, things that you would never want to know ever happen, but are completely 100% necessary Absolutely. to ensure certain things. I kind of agree with that. You don't want to see behind the veil, guys. Yeah. There's a lot of bad things that we have to do on a week-to-week -week basis. Now, is it literally like, um, you know, constantly like sticking knives up guys' buttholes in freaking foreign lands to get them to tell us where this is and that is? Potentially. Potentially. Is it every single day? Probably not every single day. But do things like that happen on a, a constant enough basis to where you probably don't want to know about it? Yeah. And I, I think that when it comes right down to it, you have a lot of things that have to be done in a wartime moment that are required. Now, as long as it's a justified war, it has to be a justified war. You have to have a reason. You can't go over there and talk about, I want to find Osama bin Laden and never find the guy and decide that you want to go after Saddam Hussein. That's not right. We actually That's bait and switch. Both of them That's actually. bait and switch, though. Actually. Saddam Hussein wasn't doing nothing. Saddam Hussein was just being a warlord in his own country, screwing things up. And listen, I don't have Saddam to... Hussein wasn't doing nothing? Go ahead. Stop. Go ahead. He's in his own country doing his own thing. If somebody came over to your country and told you you couldn't watch Missouri football anymore, how would you react to him? Yeah, Saddam Hussein didn't. How invade, would you? Saddam Hussein didn't invade Kuwait or anything. How would you? Yeah. Dude, oh, that was a two-week war. It was over. Did, and he didn't help fund terrorism or anything. Two-week like war, and that was over. So what we disagree on basically is whether hey. our actions of late, in terms of Iraq, and some of the other things we've done in the Middle East, if those first actions off, have been justified. First off, first off, it's their country. Just like you don't want them coming over to your country and telling you what to do with your country, because the minute they do that, we're going to try to buff our chests up and go. No, F you. You don't come over to our house and tell us how to run our shit. That's literally what we would say to them, because I'm an American. I know exactly what I would say to them, and I know exactly what Travis and a lot of all of our friends would say to these people, okay? Because we all grew up in the same country, with the same Michael Jacksons, the same everything, okay? My point is, is that we should think that our rules apply to them, too. We shouldn't think that if we go into their country and try to tell them how to run their shit, that they won't puff their chest up and go, no, F you. That's the point. Our rules, our land. Their rules, their land. They're separate things. Our constitution does not apply to them, and their constitution does not apply to us. So what happens when, as you say, you start out in this idea that our rules, our land, their rules, their land. What happens when their land, or someone within their land, 
becomes a threat to our land. Well, we and take we care did. of that. We have, and, and I agree that we should take care of that. We did, no, we did take care of that. Well, it's not done. No, it is done. No, it's not done. Give me an example. Is, is militant Islam completely eradicated from this earth? Militant Islam will never be completely eradicated from this earth. Then to sit the there, be at war. Okay, the war on terror, okay? I got the war on love coming up right after that, okay? Do you understand my point? You have an ideology of something that you're trying to go after. You can't tear down an ideology. It doesn't, it, 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 it's, not, it's not something that exists. You're trying to say that basically you have a war on whack job crazies. We get it. You have a war on white job. Everyone's got a war on white job. Let me interject something here. When it comes specifically to the terminology of the war on terror, and I've said this on this show before. Okay. I have always hated that terminology. Okay, I've good. Always hated good, that Good, because, it, 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 because it's completely me, misleading. Because to me, that would have been like saying in World War II that World War II was the war on kamikaze pilots. Obviously, it's not. Kamikaze pilots were just one mechanism of, that uh, our enemy used and to attack us. To, right. to sit there and, it, it, you know... Will you ever be able to tear, tear down terrorism? It's like the question you asked at the beginning of the show. Will we ever be able to live within peace? No. No. Because the fact that you can't live in peace, that means two people will constantly create terror for each other. So there will never be a day when terrorism or even your militant Islamism that you hate. Islamism? Whatever. That is never going to not exist. So... Either we learn how to deal with it and we take each bump in the road as it comes, or we sit here and we run ourselves into a wall crazy thinking that we're always going to be able to tear it down and fix it when we'll never be able to do that. Sorry, I didn't need that. I'm just saying. That's what I in this beautiful computer. But I think where we're disagreeing, because there's a lot of things we agree on here, it sounds like. Okay. We agree that human beings probably will never be able to live in peace. No. We agree that uh, we do have to protect ourselves. Our nation has to protect itself yep. first and foremost. Of course, of course. I think where we disagree is on the extent to which our nation has to go in order to protect itself. I would say that a war on terror, okay, that, that's a very, very misleading term. I've always hated it. I've always thought, and this might be where you disagree, but I've always thought we needed to be more upfront about what this really is. This is a war between two cultures. It's not even really a war between two countries. It's a war between two cultures, and yeah, to, to the extent that that particular religion has a large role to play in it's that culture. It's weird that you say that. I suppose it is a war on their religion. It is a war on two cultures to an extent. I think what it really comes down to is, is they're just not willing to leave the other people alone. Yeah. Okay? That's what it really comes down to. See, the United States of America, we're willing to leave others alone in general. Generally, yeah. Okay? We don't go around kicking down doors. We're not, you know, Caesar. We're not trying yeah. to take over lands or anything. Although, we technically could. Yeah. The, the day and age of nuclear weapons and allies and the fact that the Chinese army could destroy us because of their physical size. Things like, like those things still exist, but we don't play that game anymore the yeah. way that they used to. We don't like get all the armies together and we start storming. There's the a lot of other things. You we can do, do other things. Physical. Yeah, we do other things now to change the game. And I think that the other countries just need, it's, it's one of those things. There's always going to be that kid in school that you just don't like. And he doesn't necessarily like you either, but as long as there's that understanding that you guys know that you don't like each other and you just leave each other alone, everybody's fine. It's when one or the other decides that they want to play in the other one's playground and create the problem. You know, if, if I have a playground and that kid's got a playground and we don't like each other and he goes, listen, stay on your side of the playground, stay over here, I won't come over here, I won't bother you at all. Same goes for you though. You don't come over here, you don't bother me at all. We didn't realize the problem that we had with that playground over there. That's the problem with the whole Iraq situation in terrorism and where this all came from on 9-11. We didn't realize that that existed at that level. We knew that, yeah, they have a religion where they talk down on us a lot, but we didn't realize that it had gotten to that boiling point that they decided that they were going to try to take planes into our buildings. Like, right, to, to the extent, maybe, maybe a better way to phrase it. Because that caught everybody off guard. Yeah, well, maybe a better way to phrase it would have been that we knew there was a problem, but, and, and I can say this for myself, even back when I grew up, I knew there was a problem over there. I knew those people were nut jobs and whatever else, but the thought I always had, and people I was around always had prior to 9-11 was, you know what? They're all attacking each other, blowing each other up over there. As long as they just keep doing that, as long as they leave us out of it, yeah, it's the but same the idea second, in World War Two. Yeah. But the second they attacked us, totally different ball game. And now we have to essentially do a house cleaning over there. Now, the now we don't. But see, that's the well, problem. That's the difference. Once you go, okay. So, but here's the thing. That's what most conservatives say. We have to do a house cleaning over there. 
That's not how it's presented to the American public, which is liberals and moderates and Republicans that all vote together. The guy who's the number one conservative, which is the president at the time, George Bush, mm -hmm. presents this as, well, this is a war on terror. We need to go after Osama bin Laden. So that's how he presents it to everybody. But what he really wants to say is, we want to pull some guns out and clean house, man, because we just love running around with our guns out cleaning house. That's what he wants to say. He didn't say that because he knew he couldn't get support that way. But if he goes, we want to get that guy who took down those buildings, okay, you pointed it at one specific person in his little group of people, so now everybody's going to be a little bit more understanding and be like, okay, yeah, we need to get that dude. The problem arose when we didn't get that dude. When we didn't get that dude, all the, all the nut job, all, all the conservatives at the time, two years into that war on terror, okay? Let's, let's, let's move forward to 2005. Two years into that war on terror, after his re-election and all that, okay? Mm -hmm. We still hadn't gotten Osama bin Laden. It had happened. In fact, at that point, most people were trying to figure out if he was still alive or dead. Because there had been multiple bombings in the mountains of Afghanistan and things like that. People thought he might have just gotten killed and they were just putting out random tapes. Yeah. Old stuff, okay? They didn't even really know. So while that's going on over there, they're like, you know what? We got other problems with some people over here. So since we can't find this guy, we're going to go after this guy over here. Well, what's our problem with him? Well, we had Kuwait. It ended two weeks later, or like actually 48 hours later. But... It, two weeks later, pretty much that situation was done. You didn't even hear Saddam Hussein's name for like 12 years. Like legitimately, like, like not in the news. He didn't do anything bad. He wasn't a part of anything. It was just like Saddam Hussein, Kuwait, beat that shit down. We move on. 12 years, nothing. You didn't hear shit. What I would say, Word. what I would say, and you're going to be surprised that I agree with you to a degree on this. I think a mistake that George W. Bush made mm -hmm. was basically saying, as you said, that this was essentially an issue with Osama bin Laden and the Taliban strictly, right. or Al-Qaeda strictly. I have always said, and those of you who watch this show from day one, you've heard me say that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda are the symptom and not the disease. And George W. Bush essentially identified the symptom and tried to treat that instead of treating the disease. Now, once Saddam Hussein got involved in it, we started going in Iraq, my thought, and this may be where we disagree, my thought was, okay, we're finally treating the disease, even if George W. Bush isn't do you coming out saying, do you, re do you remember how we got him involved? It was very interesting. We asked them if we could come into their land. We asked them to find Osama bin Laden. And he said, no, I don't think that that's right. I don't want to be a part of your issue. This is what Saddam Hussein said. Like, I'm not defending Saddam Hussein, but... We went to him and said, we are looking, no, 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 listen, we are looking for Osama bin Laden. He said, well, I will try to help you guys as best I can, but I don't think that that's right. What do you mean you don't think that that's right? The minute that he did just immediately agree with what we wanted to do in his own country, that's when we started to have a problem with him. See, that's not right. Just because he, in his own land, his own rules, doesn't agree with us wanting to be pushy, that doesn't make him a bad person, and all of a sudden, before you know it, it's like, he pushes a little, then he pushes back. And that's what we push a little, and he that's pushes back. I would say, at that given time, given the history we had had with Saddam Hussein. But why? That, that he was not trustworthy. When but why would you create the problem? You're we, just we, asking we him to go into his land. We why not, create we the did problem? We create the problem. We didn't create the problem? He created, he, he which, which He had nothing started? to do with Osama bin Laden. We don't know that. We might not know that, but he you was, don't. Okay, you might not know part. that the guy next door is beating his wife, and you might not be friends with any of his family members. But if you saw him beating his wife, would you step in? Would you step in? Of course I would. Okay, so my point is, is just because you don't know things, doesn't mean it's necessarily a good or bad idea to do those things. Here is the problem we run into. Obviously, this has been set up to be okay. It's Osama bin Laden. We got to find him. Blah blah blah. But because there had been a level of mistrust already with Saddam Hussein there, and because we knew it made sense that Saddam Hussein could potentially be in cahoots with him, whether he was or not, directly or indirectly, we knew that they were both part of that toxic culture that attacked us. We knew that if there was any sort of doubt, and, and Hussein stopped us at all, which he tried to do, as you point out, okay. that we have to go in and uh, make sure... You got any friends who drink? You drink? Yeah, drink. You got any friends who like to drink? You don't have to give uh, any yeah, names. Yeah, back in the old days. You don't have to give any names. Yeah. So you got a friend who likes to drink real mm -hmm. heavily. You guys went to a bar one night. Mm -hmm. You get pulled over on the way home. But you're not drunk. You didn't drink. Yeah. You, you just had sodas. Mm -hmm. But he was driving. 
You know, it might not have been the best move by you, but yeah, he was driving. Be driving. He was driving, but he was driving in this case, in this hypothetical. He was driving. The cop pulls you both out of the car and arrests you both. Tries to, to, to throw the, 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 uh, the, because you are with the situation, because you are associated with that individual, that you obviously fall into the same drug category yeah. as that individual. Now, we have ways to preclude that here in the United States, yeah. you know, ways to stop that, uh, breathalyzers and things like that. But when we're talking about such a general thing like you're talking about, just to assume something over here, because they know each other or they're in the same relative area as each other, that's a pretty big jump, man. It is a pretty big jump, but when we're talking about our own safety and security, I think it's a jump that you sometimes have to make in those very critical situations. I, I would say I if there's a situation that dictated, if a guy just tells you, no, I don't want you coming into my land, I don't think that, it's like going up to, we live, on the, we live relatively close to rural areas, if you walked on somebody's land and they're like, no, I don't want you on my land, are you really going to just pull your pistol out and go, no, I want to walk on this land? And he's gonna go. Oh no! I want you to not walk on my land. Like that's not gonna. Like if it escalated that fast for no reason, you'd kind of probably sit there and go, "Whoa, what is going on here?" This <laughs> dude, I'll just step off your land. It's cool. It's cool. You know. Well, there'd been no indication that Hussein was gonna do that. So we we had a previous history. You guys like certainly, listen. I love certainly in this, certainly in this case, I didn't think. And I know we're rehashing a whole. I love conservatives. Here. I love conservatives. But here's my thing. You guys love pulling your guns. See, yeah. that was my argument. <laughs> that was my argument with this the show that I did before you came on. Of a few weeks before you came on, I did a show about the Second Amendment. You guys aren't trying to argue the fact whether it's the right to bear arms or not. Because you have the right to bear arms. You always had the right to bear arms. All you got to do is go and buy a gun and then go through the paperwork and you can have a gun. And you can have as many guns as you want. And actually, you don't even have to buy them legally. You can have them as long as they're in your persons in the state of Missouri, specifically. Yeah. You can just have a gun. Okay? The right to bear arms is not what you guys are always arguing. You're, you're arguing the right to use arms we for are. whatever you want. We are? That's yes. That, and now you, the, the, the problem is we're there's going, only... We're going into another area that... The problem is... No, no, it's about war. The only, the only amendment that talks about guns is the Second Amendment. So since you have no other amendments or no other laws to argue about when it comes to guns, that's the one you guys always point at. And the problem is, is that you have the right to do that. Yeah, we do have the right under the Second Amendment, but I'm not sure where okay, you're making the bridge. Go on, go on. I don't know where you're making no, the bridge. No, 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 that's, that's what you're saying. That's what I'm completely confused there. Uh, but the, 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 bottom, the bottom, yeah, I'm sure you were. I have no idea where it was. But the bottom line is, you and I agree that we have to take care of ourselves and our own safety above all else, of and that sometimes in an extreme situation, rules and conventions and international law and things like that might have to stand down and might have to step aside so that we can protect ourselves. I think in that respect there's a lot we agree on. It's where we get into the specifics of some of these wars where we disagree. Right. I don't think Vietnam was worth it and I don't think the, the Kuwait thing and, was right and I don't think that, that anything over the last 25 to 30 years was, was a proper war. Like there is a totally different situation. And I would totally disagree with some of that. Of but, there's the general, the general argument, and I'll be back with a second with my final thoughts. The idea that humankind can somehow live together in, in some sort of long-term peace is an attractive idea. There's no question about that. Unfortunately, world history and just common sense about human nature proves to you that such a lofty goal is impossible for humans to achieve. Therefore, the goal of any society should not be to achieve some sort of permanent or lasting peace that is impossible to attain, but instead the goal of a society should instead be to shift its focus towards how to be best prepared for the wars and the conflicts that will inevitably arise. This is not to say that we as a nation should go out looking for trouble, but instead that our consistent maintenance of superior firepower, for lack of a better term, and our willingness to use said firepower when necessary can be the most effective method of avoiding as much conflict as possible and effectively dealing with a conflict that cannot be avoided, such as our current conflict with militant Islam. We must realize that we are one of only a few truly civilized nations on the planet. As Mark and I discussed, there are some people that you just can't reason with, that you just can't negotiate with. Therefore, the majority of conflicts we will have and certainly those in the Middle East presently will be against people who are not civilized in the manner in which we are. And therefore people who cannot understand negotiation, cannot understand trade-offs,
the way that we do. Instead, you must speak to people like that in a language that they can understand. And that language, more often than not, is violence. Wasting time worrying about fairness or conventions or international law or understanding our enemy, all of that is an act of folly when you're dealing with our own safety and our own security. Whether we're better than them or sinking to their level, as you often hear the left say, all of that is not important. It's not important whether we show that we're better than them. It's not important whether or not we sink to their level. What is important is who survives and who does not survive. That's the only thing that matters in a war. Nobody is in favor of war, certainly not even the conservatives. However, we on the conservative side understand that war is a necessary component of the human condition. It cannot be avoided. One that, while its risk can be minimized to some degree, it can never be eliminated. Therefore, we should always be prepared for the worst in hopes that such preparation will, in the end, keep us from having to engage in war to such a degree any more than is absolutely necessary. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.